Hope you were encouraged, even especially by that last song. So much truth there. So many lines that are full of grace and reality and truth that will be ours even in the future. So we jump back into Romans today. And so Romans chapter 8, uh, if you want to go ahead and turn there, turn your Bible on or flip the old school pages to Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're going to be looking at just a few verses, verses 14 through 17. And as you're finding your place, I think this question, this thought from J.I. Packer helps us jump into the text in hopefully profound ways this morning. Packer said this, he said, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. You know, one of the things this week is dealing with Romans 8, 14 through 17, specifically even as an adoptive dad, I was reminded that my deepest joy and the deepest reality of my life is to know that the work of the Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit in adopting me as a son of God is more profound than anything I could even explain this morning. You see, a lot of times people, when we think about the ministry of adoption, we jump first and foremost to the practice of serving the vulnerable. That's a lot of times where we go. Often, even today, that's where many people who have really good social intentions jump to how can we help serve the vulnerable. And often what we bypass is the deep, rich spiritual truth of what it means to be an adopted son son or daughter of God. And so before we think about adoption care, foster care, serving the vulnerable, I would suggest to you that we must think deeply about the richness of our adoption into God's family, what it truly means to be a Christian. And so help this week... um, just to give credit where credit is due, Tony Morita, uh, who I often quote, uh, sort of captured his division of this text to help us really walk through it. And so um, if you're interested in that, you can go to idcraleigh.com, pull this Romans 8 up and listen to, uh, to another sermon on this subject. But his categories of identity, of Intimacy and inheritance help us walk through this passage, I think, very well. And so let's jump in and notice what Paul says to the church at Rome and to the church right here at Hope in Anderson about our identity, about intimacy that we have, and about our inheritance. Verse 14, Paul writes, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit, himself bear, bear, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The very first thing that Paul does, as he, his logic and theology is still flowing out of what he's already said about the work of the Spirit in helping us understand that we are to be fighting sin, he now begins to couch even this paragraph in a lot of what's called familial family language. And so just to draw your attention to our identity, notice how even all the way back up in verse 12, this paragraph all the way to verse 25, really two paragraphs, are saturated with just family terms and family language. Verse 12, you see brothers and sisters can be Uh, implied there. So we see the idea of siblings. If you go a little bit further, the text that we just started with, sons of God, you see that. Also notice verse 15, the spirit of adoption as sons. If you go into verse 16, are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Skip on down to verse 19. Notice again this familial language. He says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And then verse 21 at the end, of the glory of the children of God. And then again in verse, uh, if you slip on down to verse 23, again, adoption as sons. 
One of the ways that the New Testament emphasizes the story of redemption is through family language. This is not something that is foreign neither to the Old Testament or the New Testament. These types of images, this type of language is employed in many places. As a matter of fact, the Bible, the storyline of the Bible can be carried through with family concepts, family intimacy, the ordering and the design of the family. You could say, say it this way, the orientation of God's story is towards the family room, not just the courtroom. And so adoption, the very word that Paul uses here, theologically rich, spiritually powerful, is the word huothesia. It's a combination of words that actually means to be placed as a son. And what Paul is doing in this specific passage is he's drawing on Greco-Roman cultural practices. And he's helping make a bridge between something that is happening in the world of the practice of adoption, but he's elevating it to the spiritual reality of what it means to be a Christian. He is employing family language to teach us that in the gospel, we see adoption as the crown jewel of the greatest story in the world. The crown jewel. So he's employing this language to teach us that we get God as our father. We'll see this. Christ is our elder brother and one another as brothers and sisters. This is what we see. And it's important to understand that there are no natural born children of God. There are only spiritually born sons or daughters of the Most High. And at the very heart of the gospel is God setting his affections down on us and bringing us into the family. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a truth. Sadly, most of what's called systematic theology books, which are sort of doctrines that are specified, and you have all kinds of people throughout church history who have written massive volumes on what's called systematic theology, many of them actually do not even include a section on adoption. And I think Packer and others, even Paul, is right to recapture this as part of our identity Tony said this, he said, the greatest work of grace is not our adoption or care of the fatherless, but it's God's adoption of us through Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you have an adoption story. Amen? If you're a believer in Jesus, we can talk about some of the same things. Uh, We're not naturally born into this, and so... We have to understand this. Paul elsewhere would say to the church at Ephesus, listen to this in chapter 1, verses 4 and 6. He says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now notice why. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Over and over and over again, in the New Testament, especially Paul he wants us to know that to be a Christian is to be to have this identity as an adopted child. And one of the things that's so helpful when you think about identity as a Christian, this truth has to work itself down deep into our soul so that we can function appropriately. A lot of the reasons that we're so sort of short-circuited in our practice as a Christian is because we have not deeply mused nor realized who we are in Jesus. Not partially adopted, Not on the outside of the family room looking in, but seated in the family room with God himself as our father. This is so important because so many problems in your life, my life, arise when we don't remember our identity. So just a couple of things, thinking about that the heart of the gospel is adopting grace and mercy. Let me just give you some dangers when we don't realize this this identity that Paul is zeroing in on now in Romans 8. First of all, there's the danger of just seeing God as only holy judge and not a loving, merciful father. This is so important. The danger of just seeing God as a holy judge and not a loving, merciful father. A.W. Tozer said it right. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. A lot of people grew up only thinking that God was this holy, righteous judge. 
And that is, a, that is an important truth that we would never cast away. It's interesting that even in this great book of Romans, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone, is central. But how kind of Paul to not let us just stay in one part of the ocean. Because that's what a lot of people do. Like, if you think about your background, are you stuck in one part of this great ocean of God's grace? I would suggest that to help us with our identity, we need to swim in the fatherhood of God. We need to to get out of just this idea that God is only judge. He is a loving, merciful father. What a concept. I've referenced this book before, I think a year and a half ago. Dane Ortland produced Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. Let me say that subtitle again because we all should resonate with this. The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. That's where everybody should say amen. Amen. Even on your best day, all right? The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. But he talks about, there's there's a Trinitarian sort of take through the book But at the end of the book, there's a chapter titled, uh, Father of Mercies. Um, And this week, just rereading this idea of, okay, my identity as an adopted son or daughter, my identity as a child of God, that God is not just judge, not just working things out doctrinally and neatly, but he's also a tender, loving Heavenly Father. Listen to what Ortland writes, which may help someone this morning. He says, as you consider the Father's heart for you, remember that he is the Father of mercies. Now, listen to this next part. He's not cautious in his tenderness towards you. He multiplies mercies matched to your every need. And there is nothing God would rather do. Remember, said the Puritan John Flavel, That this God in whose hand are all creatures is your father and is much more tender of you than you are or can be of yourself. Your gentlest treatment of yourself is less gentle than the way our heavenly father handles us. His tenderness toward you outstrips what you are even capable of toward yourself. Do we really believe that God is our Father? You see, there's a danger of not seeing the relationship rightly between the son and daughter and our Heavenly Father. The second danger, quickly, is the danger of trying to earn His love. And I think that this, depending upon your relationship with your Heavenly Father, or excuse me, your earthly Father and all the breakdown of the family, this is one that creeps in and it can actually remain and do a lot of damage. The danger of trying to earn his love. Maybe you grew up in a demanding situation. Maybe there were legalistic bents. Maybe there was and maybe even there remains within your family a hypersensitivity or pressure to perform. To, to sort of check all the boxes off on being a good son or daughter, a good human. <laughs> and maybe you've carried over in your relationship with the Father of trying to earn his love. Well, the Bible's clear. We don't earn his love. We receive it. John would even say in John chapter 1, verse 12, but to all who did receive him... Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. You see, we receive the love of the Father through the work of the Son. We can never perform to earn it. As a matter of fact, that is actually not the gospel. The gospel is you get grace and mercy. You receive. The gospel is, it is finished, I receive it. It is finished, I receive it. It is finished, I receive it. Every day when it creeps in that you have to perform, that you have to earn the love 
of a tender heavenly father. You need to preach the gospel to yourself. You need to see that Jesus' work was not partial. It was full and free. And that by faith in him, you're receiving amazing love. Amazing love. Some of you in your identity, even here this morning, think that you have to earn it. How freeing. How freeing. That God loves me on my worst day. The danger of trying to earn it. Another danger, here it is. The danger of logic, systems, emails, text messages, and contracts. That's a lot, right? Big sentence. Somebody's like, can you shorten your sentences? I did. I took five things out of that one. (laughs) Right? The danger of logic, systems, emails, text messages, and contracts. For my friends, I think you know what I'm talking about. Like, even a couple weeks ago, like, we're trying to work hard to send you emails on how to navigate this new space, right? Like, where's the coffee line? (laughs) right? How do we get into kids ministry? What time do we start? Where do we park? Right? And we want to do good things. But many people who sit here have so baptized logic and systems and neatness and orderliness into the view of the gospel that we've robbed it of its power. (laughs) That to sit in the family room with a father and to spill the Cheerios all over the floor is actually normal. Parents, do you know what I'm talking about? How many new parents are frustrated right now because your kids are growing up and they're just messing it up? (laughs) Any any amens? Any witnesses? How many older parents whose kids are gone now, you know exactly what I'm talking about? Man, you want it clean and neat. You want it orderly. You want it to work efficiently. You don't want to be embarrassed. And guess what? Every day, something else is knocked over something's broken it just it's never ending praise god hallelujah and there is a danger that has been downloaded into many american christianity thought that if we just can neatly tighten it up we can get the doctrine of justification nailed down right we can get the doctrine of his holy righteous judgment nailed down boy we got it right and then we miss that it's not just the courtroom it is the family room It's the family room. Some people love the exactness of the law, right? We love the efficiency of systems. And maybe, just maybe this morning, you need to swim in the fatherhood of God. That we have an adoptive status. There's so much more. And then another danger just practically quickly, is the breakdown of the nuclear family when it comes to this identity. Sons of God, children of God, brothers and sisters, adopted as sons and daughters. You see, the breakdown of the family is really, really increasingly difficult for people to understand this message. This is why we should fight tooth and nail for healthy families as Christians. Let me say that again. We should fight tooth and nail on our knees Committed to one another so that we could help commend this gospel to people who are watching. The danger of the breakdown of the nuclear family. You see, the fabric of God's design, when it is eroded, it becomes harder and harder for people to understand or even embrace this. This is why we at Hope Church should be in each other's corner. Listen, that means that marriage counseling... Like, I don't think, I understand the professional part of it, but man, it like ought to always be happening. I'll never forget listening to two high profile pastors. One of them said he and his wife were in counseling for like 10 years. And so many churches, that's sort of taboo. The breakdown of the family. So important. So how do you think? Here's a question. When you think about this identity. Brothers, sisters, children of God, sons of God, adopted as sons and daughters. How do you think of yourself this morning as a Christian? Let's just get personal. Are you suffering from loneliness? 
because you're not putting maybe the work in necessary to build relationships? That could be one reason. Everybody wants, it's amazing how many people over the last few years, they'll be interested in Hope Church and they'll, they'll at, I'm looking for community. I'm like, well, I can't Amazon that to you. <laughs> Drives me nuts. It's like, uh, but how do you think, are, are you suffering, or are you suffering from loneliness because you're actually outside the family of God and you've not received his love by faith trusted in Jesus? That's the linchpin. Because as a Christian, we have God as our, this is our identity. We have God as our father, Christ as our elder brother, and one another as brothers and sisters. And this is a reality. So we have our identity. Secondly, though, there's this beautiful category of now our intimacy. Two things I want to point out. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So the first thing I want us to see in regards to this issue of intimacy, and I think it's appropriate, is that the closeness we have is actually in our relationship to the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 is actually linked to verse 14. And it definitely is a continual thought of like our fight against sin. But what is implied here is something deeply spiritual is happening in our life. That is this. That is if we're indwelt by the Spirit, we are also gladly submissive to the Spirit. And so it's not out of step when you think about the image of the father and the sons and daughters, like the relational rightness is not delayed obedience. It's definitely not disobedience that we want our children to be obedient. Parents, let me just help you. Obedience, requiring obedience is not harming our children. Now there's means to that that can be wrong, But what we see here is one of the things in regards to the picture of intimacy is that we are led by the Spirit, which I think implies that we are submissive to the Spirit, that we are walking in step with the Spirit. And so one of the ways that you could describe your relationship to the Father and the Spirit is that you and I are submissive to to Him. So there is a sense in which our closeness to the Holy Spirit is His leadership over us, right? Right? That's what, who are, notice what the language, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It's a a statement of declaration. It's a statement of truth. It's not optional. Paul is not saying that this is an optional conclusion that you draw. No, no. He's saying that this is actually how it works in the family. That the Spirit of God, we're submissive to the Spirit of God, and so therefore we are termed, titled, called, identified as sons of God. There is a direct link between our glad submission to the Spirit and the title that we're given. We're led there. Do you struggle with authority? Do you struggle with glad-hearted submission to King Jesus, to the Holy Spirit? One of the ways that, that there is closeness in our relationship It's through the recognition of who God is, who the Spirit is, who Jesus is, and our role as a glad-hearted, submissive participant following him. But I would suggest to you that this intimacy takes off in the next verse. It soars beyond just our relationship being led by the Spirit. Notice how verse 15 soars, helps us understand even greater this idea of intimacy Verse 14, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. There's so much here in one verse, but this is where this intimacy picture takes off, doesn't it? Some would actually say that this verse, verse 15, this particular contrast between slavery and sonship is the emphasis of this paragraph, right? Think about it. So as a slave in bondage or Egypt to sin, we have a life of fear and we are shackled to an unruly, godless master. Think about that. Under fear, living in fear, under the cruel hands of a taskmaster. But what's being demonstrated in this contrast, four, verse 50, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So much here that I want to try to help us see. 
that instead of living in fear, fear has been replaced now with freedom in our adoption. Fear has been replaced with freedom because we are an adopted son or daughter of God. The work of the Spirit in actually making us a son or daughter actually yields a cry of security and endearment. Let me say that again. The Spirit's work in our life moves us from fear of an ugly, evil taskmaster into the freedom and joy and peace and contentment of a merciful, conscientious, loving Heavenly Father. That's what's happened. Some say that this is a picture of our conversion. That's what Paul is illustrating here. That now we have contentment as a son or daughter. And that it sort of takes off in the cry, notice, the cry, the deeply spiritual, profound, emotional cry of a Christian. Notice the last part. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, the grounds of this cry, this assurance is gained by the Spirit, and it's also the result of the work of the Spirit in our life. It's both the acknowledgement, so it both explains how this can be, right? And it motivates us to know who we are in Christ, who is ours. This is intimacy. This is a deeply profound, deeply spiritual experience. You see, the doctrine of adoption is not just a theological category that we preach on. It is not just something we discuss over coffee, and it is not something we just write books about. It is the Christian life. To be a Christian is to be fully known, fully loved, fully cared for by a merciful Heavenly Father. This is simply this cry, Abba, Father. Paul is imploring both Greek and Aramaic languages to help us understand something deeply profound. Something that is deeply spiritual. Some commentators say, don't get too carried away with this. And what I would suggest, this is a, a dynamic, powerful, emotional reality of a child to his father. One of the things that was super hard for me, a um, little bit of an adoption story here. One of the things that was super hard for me when we brought Ellie home was that she quickly attached to Krista and to Aaron and Luke. I mean, it was like instantaneous. And for about a year, I would, I would get frustrated because I wanted to nurture I wanted to hold her. I wanted to act as her dad. I wanted that relationship. I just wanted it there. Boom, right? And there were so many emotions that I went through in that. I would often get frustrated. You know, everybody talks about how adoption, you know, from the outside, it's cute, nice, and neat. Well, that's not true. <laughs> it looks good, but it's warfare. And so I was like frustrated a lot. But slowly and surely, that connection grew and it changed. I can't necessarily pinpoint a moment, but I can assure you that it's strong today. That our relationship, hear me, for all my systems folks. <laughs> That that relationship goes much deep, deeper than a legal change. It is profoundly familial. And what I would tell you today is that I am fully her dad and she is fully my daughter. And here's what you need to know. This act supersedes biology. It supersedes biology. What's so beautiful about this cry is that I don't have to perform. I can be at my worst. 
And that my heavenly father loves to hear the cry of his son even when he's broken. When he doesn't fit in. When he has messed up. When he has stumbled. That my father loves to hear the cry of his children. Abba, father. Dad. This act supersedes biology. It is deeply spiritual. We have our intimacy with our Father. And then lastly, we have our inheritance. Notice verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's assurance. Likely two witnesses, pulling from Old Testament that there must be two witnesses. This provision of assurance that we don't have to doubt that we can be assured of this. But then he sort of adds to this, and if children, verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 17 builds on the reality of our new identity in Christ, that as Christians, we have an inheritance. We have many blessings now, but we have a truckload of blessings later, right? Right? We have been justified, we are being sanctified, and one day we will be glorified. And it's important for us to understand that we have an inheritance partly now, fully later, and that what's more important about this, though, is it's very easy to get caught up specifically in all of the extras. And what I think is most profound about this verse is where where it terminates. Notice what the inheritance is. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You see, the, the superior gift of our adoption isn't stuff. It's God. It's God. And how important it is for us to remember this. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you how this helped me. So, end of the week, pretty difficult. I was down on myself. Krista will tell you, yesterday evening I get home I'm, I'm upset. I'm down on myself. I'm frustrated. I'm sad. I'm angry. all these different things. And so last night as we go to bed, I said, Krista, will you just pray for me? So just a short prayer because we were tired and we're close to 50. And it's, it's like two sentences in Jesus' name. Boom. And this morning I get up, go get my coffee. I think God is going to let me have coffee in heaven. And so coffee and Bible I look out my front window, I'm still down on myself, and I don't worship the sun, but the sun is coming up, I see the rays, and I'm standing there in my front window thinking about this, I have God as my Father, and He is enough. That by your grace, I get to see this scene. By your grace, I'm no longer who I used to be. By your grace, I don't have to fit into your mold. Christ said it's finished. I trust his work. I get to be a part of the family room. I get to spill the Cheerios. And my heavenly father extends his mercy and grace to me. And the inheritance that I have is God himself. It's Christ. It's God. It's the spirit. And we love this stuff, don't we? Some of you are so attached to the stuff that you don't see the beauty of the most sufficient, most awe-inspiring, eternal satisfaction that could ever be. It is God himself. Are you detached from the stuff and are you in awe and enamored by a father whose mercies are rich and new every morning? Rich and new. You see, this is the greatest gift. It's God and his Christ. But interestingly, how does he end this? This this qualification of who are children and who will receive an inheritance, there's this interesting qualification at the end. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified. Surely not. Surely not. Life's supposed to be easy. Right? I mean, let's not preach that. Let's not ask people to sacrifice. 
Let's not, let's not embrace sorrow. Let's not actually see it as a theological system. Let's actually not see it as part of our identity. Let's write books that say, no, that's not right. Let's, let's find the easiest route to glory. Right? Isn't that, isn't that what we want? I know sometimes I get duped with that. Man, I would love to have an easier route to glory. I, I would like for it to just be neater, easier, more efficient, coffee hot, right? And yet Paul says, no, that's not how it works here. No, he says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You see, the path for adopted children, the path to glory is through sorrow. It's through heartache. It's through having dreams that don't come to reality. It's for having even times relationships that go sour. Trying to figure out how do you navigate that? It's for having at times bank accounts that seem to be going to empty. How fitting of Paul to include the issue of suffering with the idea of the ministry of adoption. You see, adoption is costly because it isn't easy. But here's what we need to remember. Our adoption costs God his very own son. The one thing that I know for certain about being an adopted son and being an adoptive parent is it is worth every ounce of pain. Through the pain, we learn more of his grace. People ask me, what, what, what has God used to teach you about himself? I am... The word of God, absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. But I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that one of the most important things that God has used in my life to learn more of his grace is not success. It's not accolades. It is sorrow and hurt and pain and suffering. I think it was Samuel Rutherford who said this, I dive deep into the sea of affliction and I find that God keeps the rarest pearls there. The ministry of adoption changes everything. Is this your identity? Do you realize that you have this intimacy? And do you know that this is your inheritance? By God's grace, if not, then would you today receive Christ And receive his love by turning from sin and putting your faith in Jesus. That can happen right now in this moment. As we sing, you can turn from sin and put your faith in Jesus. Let's pray to that end this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you. God, I am so thankful this morning. Just knowing my own background, knowing, Lord, just knowing friends in the room here this morning. Lord, we love the doctrine of justification by faith alone. We get excited about it. There are thousands of books written about it. People love to talk about it. And God, we admit that we struggle when things like the Cheerios are flipped over in the living room. or God, we are so uneasy with each other because things aren't always neat and efficient. And so we just ask for your forgiveness. God, would you supernaturally at Hope Church for your glory make the ministry of adoption run wild among us? That it would tear off the veneer of hiding behind statements, behind experience, and you would profoundly, deeply, by the work of the Spirit, Help us to know our identity as sons and daughters. Help us to know that we have access to you, that you you love to hear our voice. And then remind us of the superior gift of our inheritance is you and you alone. And so God, we pray for our friends this morning who are outside of your family. God, would you today bring them into the family room? 
and by your grace, adopt them, place them as sons and daughters. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.